So the last video I did on suturing Zach, I'm sorry that it used the light suture. So I'm just going to repeat the last part of it that you couldn't see. This is a 2.0 silk, so it's a heavy suture. And the first one is just going to be a horizontal mattress, except this time you'll be able to see where the suture is. And it just means that you go in and out one side and out and in from the other. And I put a little magic marker along the cut in the orange this time to uh, accentuate it. And it's still very hard to manipulate orange like skin, but I'll do the best I can. So it's very simple. In one side, it tends to evert the skin edges when you use this suture, so it's nice in thick skin. They tend not to pile up on each other. Sometimes the suture gets a little stuck on the end of the needle driver. You have to pull it off with your fingers. Double throw on the first one and then single throws on the ones after that. Try to lay them down in the direction of the knot. A little easier when you're on a person that doesn't move. And then I usually do a double throw and three or four single throws, sometimes five. And that's a horizontal mattress stitch. It's good for approximating thick skin and it tends to evert the edges. So this now is going to be a vertical mattress and the point is that there's going to be a near and then a far. And as from the previous video, you might remember that the, the near one is to accurately align the skin edges, so just because so, it's so close to the edges of the skin. If it were skin, you could actually pick up the inner suture, the little two limbs, or have your assistant do it, and it would kind of tent the skin up and allow you to do this far suture in one pass. If your needle isn't big enough, you do it in two separate passes. You pick up one edge, you retrieve it in the wound, and then put it from the wound out the other side. Um, which is often what you have to do if you're not using a big needle, and often what I usually do. Two passes, you try to lay it down in the direction that you're pulling it, like that. Then you have the, the long one, it gets a lot of skin for grip, and the inside one aligns the skin edges very nicely and to, prevents them from buckling up one on another. It's very hard to go wrong with a vertical mattress suture. It's tedious to put in, it requires a lot of throws, and it's not a running suture, so it takes a long time, but it's the uh, creme de la creme of approximating skin. You can never go wrong with that. A little harder to remove, but, but sometimes those edges are not quite as exposed. Now here's one that I just wanted to show you because who knows if you're ever in this situation. If you have to sew a tendon, now you have to pretend a little bit that we're <laughs> using a different orange. Uh, I, that the tendon ends, that the torn end is on the left of the screen. And you went in through the torn end, and forget the incision in the orange, that means nothing. And now we're doing the crack house suture, or as Drew calls it, the crack house suture. But it's K-R-A-K-O-W. You then put the loop over the top, and this is a locking suture, so that when the suture pulls, it tends to clamp the suture down and lock on the piece of tissue it's around. You lay the loop down so that the, the end of the needle is going to come out through it, and you pull it up, and again, you have another locking pass. I'm going to put another locking pass in just to show you. Ignore the fact that there's a suture line in here. It means nothing. A tendon wouldn't have that. If it did and there were striations and ruptures in it, this would kind of close the ruptures down. Then you're going to go to the other side and you're going to go back down the way you came. The point of this is to have two suture limbs sticking out the end of the ruptured tendon, which in this case would be on the left of the screen. And then you would have to do it the same thing but in reverse on the other side of the ruptured tendon or torn tendon. And then you would tie them together in the middle and the knot would be buried in the substance of the tear so there would be no external knot. And that's good for gliding and rehabilitation of the tendon. So again, you pull it through. You have to make it go through the previous loop. Then when you pull it through, it's a locking suture. 
I made three passes on one, three passes the other. If it were real tendon, I, I would usually use three or four passes if it were a really degraded tendon, like a long Achilles that had a bad, that was all mush. I might use even five or six loops going all the way up. So you just have to use your judgment. Same thing in a patellar tendon. So once you get that in, then you put it in, you bury it, it goes longitudinally through the portion of the tendon where it's kind of moppy. And here you have the Krakow locking suture, very, very strong. Um, it'll squeeze that tendon before it pulls out. That's it. Good luck, at least you can see those.